Funding for this program is provided by the National Institute of Justice. Hello, I'm James Wilson. The fear of crime is often far greater than the actual risk of being victimized. And that fear harms everyone. People avoid the streets, become suspicious of their neighbors, and spend less time in community activities. People have always, the police have always come to the aid of victims of crime. Now they are beginning to help people who fear crime. Many believe that reducing the fear of crime may even help reduce crime itself. Houston is a large, sprawling city. Two million people spread over more than 500 square miles. There's no way police can patrol it on foot, but if they patrol only in cars, they're likely to meet only criminals and victims. The Houston Police Department has been conducting experiments to see if more direct police-citizen contact can help police solve crimes and citizens reduce their fear of crime. What we'd like to do is, is get uh, the information from you so that we can keep in touch and uh, develop a means of communication with the people in the neighborhood. In one experiment, police went door to door, introducing themselves, distributing newsletters with neighborhood crime information, and leaving business cards with their phone numbers. At first, some people were surprised, sometimes even nervous, seeing a police officer at their door. But they soon welcomed the police presence and began talking about neighborhood problems. We're finding out that while all the citizens are very fearful of victimization, of being direct victims of crime, and the big crimes of robbery and burglary and uh, aggravated assault. They're just as fearful of traffic problems in their area, of rowdy juveniles on the corner, of the abandoned car or cars that seem to stay week after week on their street. The result of this direct contact with citizens? Fewer people victimized by crime. Fewer people saying their neighborhood was disorderly. More people satisfied with the police and an overall reduction in the fear of crime. In another experiment, police set up a storefront office in a residential neighborhood, inviting people to drop by, discuss problems in the community, and receive assistance. And that was all that was stolen? Four hubcaps? Four hubcaps, yes. The police also used the office as a base from which to organize the neighborhood. What we're searching for here is to get the citizens who live in that neighborhood to visit the community station. Uh, utilize the services provided there and know that at any, any time in the morning or evening hours they can feel free to come in and find that information about a case that they may be involved in or just talk to an officer about what's going on in the neighborhood. Why these changes? Will they last? Here to discuss this is Lawrence Sherman, professor at the University of Maryland and Officer Robin Kirk of the Houston Police Department, a member of the experimental unit. Officer Kirk, you helped run this storefront in Houston. What did you actually do there? Well, we set out originally to organize the community and break down the barriers that existed between the uh, police officers and the citizens in our community. And by being in the uh, storefront and putting it in the geographical area that we had defined and putting it in there and trying to organize and get out and get actively, socially actively involved in the community, we felt like that we could break down that barrier. Did the neighborhood <clears throat> ask you to come in, or was this something where the police took the initiative? No, we selected this area because it had a triethnic mix of people, and we wanted to be able to be able to relate with different types of, of people. I see. Now, when you went in there and established the storefront, did it change the neighborhood? Did it change how people thought, how they acted? Well, originally, I think some people uh, didn't really realize that we were there, so we set out to more or less market our program. And we had to have use different ways of marketing the program. We used the grocery stores. We put out leaflets and in, in, uh, in the grocery stores where people come through with stuff in their bags. And, and to answer your question, yes, over the long haul now, we've been there a year, there has been a 
di different attitude of the people. Uh, How they, is it different? They feel a lot better about the police. Uh, at one of our recent community meetings, we had, I guess, more or less a testimonial. People got up and were saying that now, since they know us on a first-name basis and stuff, when they see us, one lady got up and said, well, I no longer, when I see a police car behind me, try to get away from the, per try to get away from the officer. I see if it's one of you guys that are working out in the community. So we, we really feel good about the now, police. Now, some people might say that that's good community relations, good public relations, but does it have anything to do with the fear of crime or the actual rate of crime? I think so, because the people feel better about the police, and the, people, the police are concerned about them. So when, in turn, they feel better about the, their crime, their fear of crime is a lot, is different. Because Do they, they give you leads and information that you might not otherwise get because oh, of sure, these contexts? Oh, sure, sure. There's no doubt about it. We've been able to conquer a lot of criminals in our area just simply because of the, the relationship we have with our citizens. Think about yourself for a moment. You were in regular patrol in Houston before you became connected with this storefront. How did you change as a result of this experience? I have a lot better attitude towards the people uh, because I've got a chance to meet the good people in the community on a different basis rather than in a, in a proactive way rather than a reactive way. So it's changed me in a lot of ways. I, I look at people a lot different now than I used to. How did you used to look at people? Well, from in my opinion, I, I was getting to the point that I felt like everybody was bad, no matter mm -hmm. whether they was a good citizen or a bad citizen. I just When I got a call, I didn't look at them as a you know, as a different individual. I just felt like that there was all one, all bad. And now you're meeting some of the good guys, some right. of the victims. Exactly. Not necessarily victims, Jim. They, uh, I'm getting a chance to meet them even if nothing's, in, nothing's happened to them. I've, I've met them before. How do other officers in Houston feel about this? Do they think you're doing just public relations or do they think you're really doing police work? To be honest with you, Jim, when we first started, it was a big hoopla that, you know, this is just one, another thing that the politicians are trying to do to get votes, but I think now the police officers are really seeing the benefits of this program. It is really, the officers have a positive, the ones that are directly involved and ones that are just kind of on the outside and beginning to peek in are realizing that it has benefits and they do have a positive attitude towards the citizens now. Let's uh, discuss those benefits and let me ask Larry Sherman uh, the following question. The Police Foundation went in at the invitation of the Houston Police Department to to evaluate this experiment. What did they find? We found a really remarkable thing, I think uh, far exceeding our expectations. This storefront operation that Officer Kirk directed took a neighborhood in a rapidly growing city where people had no roots, where they'd come from all over the country, a neighborhood that had no identity, and they gave it an identity. In fact, they even gave it a name um, as a result of the focus the storefront provided. And the effect of doing all that, of the kind of outreach the police were involved in, was to substantially reduce the fear of crime in that neighborhood uh, as it was measured in extensive uh, public surveys before and, and uh, nine months after the storefront went into operation. It didn't reduce the rate of crime itself, but it greatly enhanced the quality of life because people felt safer, they felt better about their neighborhood, they felt better about their police department. And uh, there's every indication that this kind of of police approach helps to integrate it, creates a community where there was none before. If they feel better about the community and they have less fear of crime, but crime hasn't actually gone down, are they really better off? Well, I, I think they are psychically in the sense of, uh, of how people feel about their city, how likely they are to stay there rather than move out to the suburbs, which has uh, very major implications for the tax bases of our cities. And the uh, uh, the question of actual victimization is, of course, uh, it's another goal the police have, and in another program in Houston was, uh, was something that the police were able to address, this, the program we'd seen about tell, knocking Tell me on about that. When they were knocking on the doors, <coughs> as opposed to the storefront operation, uh, did this produce any uh, reduction in crime or reduction in victimization? The program of assigning uh, one group of officers to one area and to have them contact uh, up to one-third of the households uh, uh, throughout the study period, which is what they reached, uh, that produced, uh, as far as we can tell, a whopping decrease in victimization, a 50% uh, reduction in the percentage of the households victimized. The percentage of the households victimized after a year or so was 50% less than it had been before. 
Wh why did this happen? H how can such a strategy have such a dramatic effect? Well, when we're cynical, we say maybe they caught the one burglar in the neighborhood who was doing all the bad crime. Um, but even doing that in itself may be an achievement. Uh, uh, the other alternative is that simply having that kind of visibility, having the sense that the police are there, that the police are paying attention to this neighborhood, may have created a kind of community awareness that in turn had uh, payoffs uh, in keeping criminals out of the area. Another way to deal with neighborhood safety is to organize the community so that it can help protect itself. Community organizing is going on in hundreds of cities. One of them is Minneapolis. Getting ready to go. She said that they're going to leave on Saturday and wanted us to watch the house. Oh, yeah. So keep an eye on it and let the other walkers uh, know about know, it. Know about it. Yeah. The Batemans live in this residential section of North Minneapolis. The neighborhood used to have a crime problem until residents got together to combat the problem. These days, citizens take turns patrolling the two and a half block area twice each night. Since the neighborhood patrol began three years ago, there's only been one house burglary. When we patrol, we, uh, we walk, we, we want to be very visible. We have our flashlights on and we uh, walk down the alley, down the street. We zigzag through the area. It's about, uh, the whole course is about one mile. Uh, and uh, we shine our flashlights in between the houses and uh, even into the windows of the homes. And a lot of times people, like I say, will come and uh, come to the window and uh, wave to us. And, and they, they feel good about it. They feel secure. Neighbors meet regularly with block leaders and the Minneapolis Community Crime Prevention Agency to share information, hand out flyers, and discuss ways to prevent crime. If you put your garbage cans in a wooden container, restraining container that makes it look owned and taken care of and that's done throughout the alleys we've noticed there's crime drops we never had this kind of cooperation before it's really neat to know your neighbors our neighbors are just super and I think this community crime prevention has brought us all closer because we're all we all have one goal in mind and that's to reduce the crime in our area make it a safer place to live this is Whittier an inner-city community in South Minneapolis. It's a high-crime area with a mixture of small businesses, rental housing, and single-family homes. The neighborhood organized against crime, and residents point with pride to their first major victory. Working with police, the community got rid of a long-standing prostitution problem. All of a sudden, there was this big push to really uh, crack down on street prostitution, the Johns in the neighborhood. And there was some initial resistance to that, just because a lot of people have a lot of vested interest in that that continue. There's this little section of town where everybody can go and pick up prostitutes, you know, and just that's the way it's been for 50 years around here. And that, you know, in the, in the spring, we started to seriously uh, attack that problem from all angles. People have noticed a difference since the prostitutes took their trade and the associated crimes elsewhere. Our evening business gets better and better and better and better all the time. Our morning business was always good. As soon as it got dark out, the place would be empty. I mean, just like there was nobody here anymore. And that's not the case anymore. Our evening business is equal to our morning business. And the only thing I could attribute that to is the fact that people feel safe walking down the street. A community crime prevention group called the Whittier Alliance helped organize the neighborhood. Well, I don't look at it so much that the organization comes in and does for the community we are of the community all our volunteers all in which um, over the years is in the hundreds are people of the community it, it's helped impact that feeling of isolation and that we're just sort of on the edge of downtown we're nothing more than an area that the bus goes through or the cabs go through that we are in fact uh, um, a neighborhood committees within the Alliance concentrate on various community groups business owners senior citizens and youth I sort of see this group as really getting involved in something for these kids that's more meaningful than just a football game or just a dance. Some police officers, however, say that community crime prevention efforts have a limited impact on crime. Citizens can patrol, but only increased arrests by the police will make a real difference. If the police don't respond by attempting to use their um, job to make arrests out on the street, uh, I don't think you're going to get anywhere. Uh, you, can, you can get a lot of lip service, maybe police attend various meetings, but eventually the police have to fulfill their part by going out and making effective arrests.
Neighborhood organizers admit it's sometimes difficult to sustain interest and enthusiasm for community crime prevention when the sense of urgency is no longer there or people move away. But for many residents, crime prevention efforts have paid off. The community realized it is a community. Um, and that, in this day and age, perhaps is the best thing of all that could have happened. Here to discuss this is Lucy Gerald, director of the Minneapolis Crime Prevention Agency, along with Lauren Sherman. Lucy Gerald, how in Minneapolis do you get people to organize, especially when the winters are so cold and the Batemans <laughs> did not look like they were having a good time out there? Well, this is winter, not summer, so <laughs> um, we organize people on the block level with volunteer block leaders and with the assistance of the crime prevention staff. If they're interested in other programs, we will work with volunteer leaders to um, develop the kind of program that would serve the need that is there. Can you keep their interest up over the long term? It's extremely difficult in, in some areas. We aren't sure yet what the key is. Uh, some neighborhoods, some programs have gone on and on, and it seems to be, make a difference who the leader is and the kind of interest that individual has in sustaining the effort. In others, once the, the initial urgency is gone, uh, the impact seems to wane. But the network, the group of people, is still there to call on when some problem comes up and we need to, to begin to use that network again. Is it better for the neighborhood, out of a sense of crisis, to organize itself and then for the city to help out, or is it easier if the city or your agency comes in first and tries something in order to get the neighborhood organized? In my experience, it works much better if the community comes to us and says, we have a problem, we're ready to work with you, rather than us going to them and saying, you've got a crime problem, can we do something? If they're not interested, it is just... Um, an unbelievably difficult task to, to, to develop that interest. Now, we saw uh, foot patrol by citizens. Mm -hmm. Is that the best strategy to combat crime on the part of citizens, or do you have to have different strategies for different kinds of neighborhoods? You must have different strategies for different neighborhoods. The most commonly used one, I think, across the country is the, and in Minneapolis, is the neighborhood watch concept of organized blocks. That doesn't work in all neighborhoods. Some neighborhoods need foot patrols. Some need maybe the McGruff safe houses where there's a problem with kids. Maybe you need to develop apartment clubs where there's a high-density um, area. Uh, another time, maybe the problem is really um, a lack of cohesiveness in a neighborhood and a mediation project might resolve some disputes that, that could uh, bring the community together. So it, um, another, another issue is maybe the actual physical security of a home and a hardware program that improves the physical security is needed. So depending on the issue, the program um, needs to be developed around that problem rather than just saying there's only one way to do it. Now the police officer from Minneapolis that we saw a moment ago uh, expressed uh, if not criticism perhaps a reservation. He said that the bottom line is the police still have to make arrests. Is that your judgment as well? The effort certainly is cooperative. We can't do it without the police. The police have their role but there's also a role for the police that is involved with the community and officers that are working in a program that we call the cop of the block where officers go out and work with the community attend meetings do some door knocking the officers have a much better feeling about the community and also they get information and are more likely to get some information that they need to make those arrests so there is a role for the police other than just um, enforcement but working with the community yeah, and what we've seen so far uh, uh, older people adults middle-aged people were involved in these community organizations or walking through the neighborhoods yet crime is primarily a problem created by young people do you are you able to reach young people and make them part of this process currently I'd say the youth are most involved in programs through schools and we are working with a juvenile mediation project where we're mediating juvenile disputes and we're also trying to develop something right now for youth because I think it's imperative that they're involved early so that they take some responsibility realizing that something isn't going to be done for them, that they have to get involved in doing something before it happens. Let's go back to Larry Sherman for a moment. Uh, Larry, uh, what have we learned from the Minneapolis experience? The basic question about whether this kind of community organizing reduces crime is still unanswered. We're still collecting data. Uh, and, and that's down the road a piece. What we've learned so far is some things about how hard it is uh, to, to do this kind of thing. Uh, um, Lucy and her people had always in the past gone into areas that had asked for help in being organized, and that's been the way neighborhood watch has been done around the country. Uh, one of the effects of that is that middle class areas, which tend to have lower crime rates, tend to have more block watch uh, organizing against crime. The areas that have the higher crime rate uh, the, the, the lower economic uh, areas uh, do not have this kind of program and they need it the most. 
uh, what, what the bold step that Lucy took was to go into areas where they hadn't been invited to try to organize neighborhoods that need it. And uh, she's really made some remarkable success in the face of that problem. But we know how hard it is uh, to do it now even better than before. We also know that the police can make this or break this from the standpoint of making the arrests that Officer Ottoson was talking about. Police only make arrests when the citizen gives them the information about who committed the crime or who the likely suspect is. And if they don't bother to get that information from the public, other than in the 911 emergency call context, um, then they're not going to have uh, the, the power to make the arrest. If they cooperate, if they take the block they've been assigned to work with and cultivate that block, get the information, then they're going to be doing a lot more than social work. They're going to be making those arrests. But if they resist the idea of getting out of their cars, talking to people, uh, and informally uh, putting together an information network, then it won't be as successful as, as it could be. So what we perhaps need is some combination of uh, the Houston effort to get the police out into the community and the Minneapolis effort to organize, help or the community organize itself. If the two can be brought together, that may offer the best chance for success. Let me ask you this. People all over the country form neighborhood watch organizations, and yet you said that we really don't know whether these neighborhood watch organizations are having an effect on on crime. Is that the case? I think that's right. Uh, it's something that has not been tested in a rigorous experimental fashion before. What happens is somebody says, hey, here's, some, here's some money, create a neighborhood watch program. You do it in one area and you compare it to another uh, in terms of the official crime statistics and, and it looks good. And on the basis of that, we've put a lot of effort into this uh, process around the country. Uh, it's faith rather than fact. And maybe the faith is right, but uh, Lucy, again, was bold enough to test it. And indeed, if we find out that it doesn't have a strong crime reduction effect, uh, then she may have some explaining to do. <laughs> well, let's hope she doesn't have to explain too quickly. Uh, officer Kirk, a lot of police officers around the country are very skeptical of citizens going out on patrol by themselves. In many cities, they've actively opposed it. How do you feel about it? Well, as long as the people have an understanding that when they go out, they're supposed to be looking and not taking any action. Mm -hmm. As long as they're schooled on that matter, I'd like to say something in, in reference to Larry, uh, what Larry just said. The, the officers <clears throat> have got to realize that yeah. without the cooperation of these watch programs, we can't function on a level other than just getting the calls for service through our dispatcher. So it is very important, in my opinion, that we get the community organized the problem you have with the watch programs throughout, our, throughout the nation, I feel like, is the police department go in and help form these watch programs, but then they don't do any maintenance on them. They go in, they help form them, they say, here gang, y'all got it, now we're gone. You know, y'all do it. And the problem is you have to do maintenance on those programs. You have to keep an officer involved in that program once it is developed. You can't pull the officer out of it. He's got to stay with it and do maintenance on it and it'll be successful. If the officer stays with the program, the officer is doing, going to be doing something very different from what he or she has been doing in the past. I mean, a lot of time in front rooms and in storefronts and talking to people rather than answering calls for service. Won't some police officers think, well, this is not real police work. I'm not catching any crooks. I'm just talking to nice people. Well, I don't think so, because once, once they get out there, they're going to realize that through those watch programs, the people are going to build a trust in them, and even then, they're going to start making, they're going to have more arrests, big time arrests. They're not, you know, and, and burglaries and things like that that they really like to do. And the, once they get involved with that community, it all works hand in hand. And that's what our project in Houston, we, ever, at first everybody thought we were a community service project. Well, we are, but that's 50% of it. We organize the people to help us. They, they're the eyes and the ears, and then we do the enforcing. And that's the way we're set up in our community. Let me ask Lucy and uh, Larry something. You've observed this process in two cities, Houston and in Minneapolis. Both of them are racially divided cities. Uh, does it make a difference what kind of neighborhood you try to organize in or what kind of neighborhood the police try to organize in? Are they more successful with some groups than with others? Success varies, yes, but I don't think it's racial. Racial lines, I think it's economics and transiency. Neighborhoods that have lower economic levels and which may be more transient because of high, you know, high density tend to be more difficult because they're not stabilized or they have mother, other pressing issues that they, they need to deal with. And in dealing with those issues or the transiency issue, you don't have that community cohesion which seems to be a real key to the success. 
Larry, what about uh, the reaction in terms of reduction in victimization and reduction in fear of crime and improved citizen attitude toward crime? Does that break out along class or racial lines at all? Well, we haven't really tested it in enough areas to know, but uh, uh, I think that the evidence suggests so far middle class areas respond much more to this kind of overture from the police. Uh, many areas, even middle class areas, are suspicious. And in fact, one program in Brooklyn where the police were knocking on doors generated lots of calls to the police to complain about somebody impersonating a police officer. We know the police would never come introduce themselves at our doorstep. Uh, there's there's got to be a revolution of expectations. People have to redefine the police role. And indeed, if they expect the police to do more of this thing, perhaps the police will be more comfortable at doing it. It, it may, may have to uh, come uh, uh, both ways. I, I think that the, the danger is that when we go into poor neighborhoods and when we go into the transient neighborhoods, that uh, the people are going to slam the door in, in the face of the police. And that's happened in Minneapolis mm -hmm. already. And that, in turn, turns the police off, and it tends to put up those barriers that Robin was talking about. We've got to keep trying to overcome that and understand the, the origins of the hostility uh, against uh, uh, the, the police or, or indeed anybody who's trying to get, get the neighborhood together to, to uh, fight crime. How have you cut through this hostility or have you encountered it? Has the door been slammed in your face? Have you had to do things that required you really to hang in there for a long period? We haven't really experienced that, that problem there uh, as much as, you know, of course, people throw, throwing the door in our face. They, You've got to remember in Houston we had a we have a bad reputation because of some incidents that occurred back in the 70s early 70s with with some people doing some officers being involved in some some uh, different types of uh, crime related things where they well uh, be specific were, the police were accused of having uh, <laughs> killed uh, yeah they were citizen. accused of, of killing killing some citizens while they were in custody so in turn uh, the the people in Houston didn't have a real good attitude towards the police and we were real fortunate. They were more or less scared. They got to the point that they were scared of the police. So that's what we were trying to do. And to answer your question, no, we haven't really encountered that. I think we have a surprise element where they're surprised. They're very surprised. And once they, once they know us, we have so many people now that actually know us personally. They don't even call us Officer Kirk or whatever. It's Robin, Mike, Charlie, or whatever. And that's what we want. That's what we, that's what we set out to do. They still respe respect us as a police officer, but they know us personally. Lucy, very briefly, do you think there's any incentives we could offer people, especially in low-income neighborhoods, to, to organize? Suppose the merchants were to say, we're so concerned about public safety, if people will join a certain organization or do a citizen patrol, we'll give them a discount in our store. Has ever, that ever been tried? We have tried to do discounts on locks and that kind of thing. That doesn't seem to work. We are currently doing Okay, I'm sorry we can't hear more about that, but we have to cut away. Thank you for joining us for Crime File. I'm James Wilson. Funding for this program was provided by the National Institute of Justice. This program was produced by the Police Foundation, which is solely responsible for its content.